<laughs> By way of quick personal background as to who I am and why, um, hopefully I have the credentials to give this talk. I served for 19 years in the Israel Defense Forces in the Judge Advocate General Corps of the IDF. And during the course of my 19 years, I had pretty extensive experience, professional experience in the legal and policy aspects of operational counterterrorism. And if you think back to the various counterterrorism decisions that Israel has been making since the mid 80s until you know, recently, for better or for worse, I've been involved in many of them. <coughs> in addition to that, in terms of my academic experience today at the University of Utah, most of my writing, not all my writing, but most of my writing addresses various aspects of counterterrorism, be it interrogations, detentions, targeted killing, drone policy, and so on and so on and so on. In addition to that, um, <clears throat> I've testified in front of Congress, I've worked with the, with the Congress on various aspects of counterterrorism, and I've also obviously worked not only with the Israeli military, obviously, but I've also worked with the U.S. military on various aspects of counterterrorism. So with that out of the way, one more quick question. Are all of you who are my generation, you're all lawyers? No. No, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> who, how many of you are lawyers? How many of you are reformed lawyers? <laughs> And you're, you're just a reasonable man. <laughs> a physician. A physician. You're not afraid of being with all these lawyers? <laughs> Any law students? <clears throat> what year? First. First. Like this is your second week of law school? So the first year we scared you to death, now we're working you to death, right? <laughs> Is that me? No, that's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sir? What's your definition of reformed lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who went to law school, evidently succeeded, graduated, did the bar, hopefully passed the bar, worked for a, worked, worked for a while as a lawyer, and then realized I want to do something else in life. Saw the light. Sorry? Saw the light. Saw the light. Does that work for you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, which category do you fall into? <clears throat> None of the above. Uh. <laughs> All right. So in the context of discussing effective counterterrorism vis-a-vis -vis civil rights, I suggest we go about this from a different number of different perspectives. And before we get into the, into the heart of the matter, one other introductory comment. I'm a firm believer in having a discussion rather than a monologue. A monologue is boring for you, boring for me, and so I very much welcome questions because I prefer for a discussion and a dialogue. So with respect to counterterrorism, the first thing you need to know about counterterrorism, the first rule of counterterrorism, is that terrorists have rights. That's rule number one of counterterrorism. That terrorists have rights. And if you forget that number one rule of counterterrorism, then at the end of the day, pardon the expression, we become just like them. Let me give you a short vignette about how this comes to play. In the, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, for a variety of reasons, I was sent by the IDF, IDF here on in is the Israel Defense Forces, I was sent by the IDF to come to Washington, D.C. to meet with people who were involved in the process of creating Guantanamo, everybody knows right, Guantanamo, the bed and breakfast in Cuba. <laughs> and I took it upon myself, not acting you know, personally, but we, we were recommending to the Americans that establishing Guantanamo would not be a particularly effective idea, neither short term nor long term. And so the individual who I was tasked to meet with is a great guy, uh, also a lawyer. And at the end of this long day of meetings, we did what people, have any of you served in the military? Okay, so you have. So what do people in the military do at the end of the long day? They you know the answer, right? They drink, right? Okay. <laughs> That's what I said. Sorry? That's what I said that. They drink. So we went out and we drank. And I said to this guy the following. I said, hey, this is somewhere around February, March, 2002. And I said to him, you forgot the first rule of counterterrorism. And his response to me was, pardon my English, his response to me was, F their rights. I said, no way can you talk like that. He said, well, that's the way it is. I said, but if you begin talking like that, and if you begin are implementing policies that reflect that policy, then at the end of the day, your policies will be just like theirs. He said, well, that's the way it is. I came back a few months later, called him up, how are you doing, blah, blah, blah. He says to me, you know, Giora, you're the world's biggest son of a bitch. I thought, you know, what did my mom do this time? And I said, why? And he said, because you were right and we were wrong. And I said, okay, and what do we do about that? And his response was, nothing. 
I said, why? He said, because there's no way that we can admit publicly that we were wrong. And I said, I find that to be more distressing than the first thing. <laughs> and the first thing distressed me a lot. Because if you're incapable of admitting a wrong in the context of counterterrorism, <clears throat> first of all, it reflects, from my perspective, weakness. And it reflects an incapability of looking in the mirror and saying, oh my, what do we do going forward? But my, our, my belief, deep belief, in this principle that, that terrorists have rights is not something that I created out of thin air. It's obviously based on my pretty deep experience in operational counterterrorism. And so I want to give you a sense of the kind of things I was involved in because it all comes back, all at the end of the day, comes back to civil rights, civil liberties, how you protect civil liberties, but not in the context of a lovely <coughs> afternoon in Chicago, Illinois, but in rock bottom operational counterterrorism. All right, example number one. How do you know what targeted killing is? You know that, well, what, okay, everybody knows what targeted So, what's targeted killing? You know what the U.S. drone, oh, it doesn't make difference if it's internal terrorists versus external terrorists? No. Ter because you have to at the end of, wait, in terms of target killing or in terms of rights? <coughs> in terms of rights. No, because the, the reason you're protecting their rights is twofold. One, in terms of who you are, and two is you also have to protect their rights. And I don't, and I don't think that the distinction can be made between internal, <coughs> external or internal domestic terrorism. No. So you, you treat dealing with terrorism in general as an internal matter, as a crime? You, you treat no, I'll get to that. I, I promise that that's one of the three things we're going to talk about. I, trust me, okay? If I don't, I'm just trying to understand. understand. Go ahead. I don't want to take this too far off track, but it seems fundamental about what, to what you're about to say. Rights, for example, would include the United States constitutional rights. Absolutely. So your answer to his question seems to suggest that you think that the United States constitutional rights would apply outside the United I do. States to I do. a non-U.S. I do. I even filed an amicus brief to the D.C. Circuit Court on that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm a firm believer, which is why I filed the amicus brief to the D.C. Circuit Court, that habeas must be extended to non-Americans held in Afghanistan and Iraq. You bet. Without, without thinking twice. Not What's exactly. the law on that right now? Well, the law on that is the administration is ducking, the Supreme Court is helping the administration duck. Do Sir? Do terrorists outside the country have any different rights than enemy soldiers? Well, Enemy soldiers protected under the Geneva Convention because the Geneva Convention protects soldiers and Geneva doesn't really extend to this thing called non-state actors. And that's one of the problems is how do, you, how do you define the paradigm that we're in at the moment, which has largely gone undefined. But hang on. Let me give you one example and then we're going to start because you guys are all lawyers you guys make a living off definitions. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Targeted killing. First of all, again, everybody knows what targeted killing is. Okay. You know how target killing works, and if you don't, let me tell you how it works, because I was involved in target killing decisions. There are four people, four actors involved in this. There's the case officer, but we have to go back one step further. There's the source. The source is the individual who provides information to the intelligence community about the individual here and after known as the target. How many of you watch TV shows like Law & Order, CSI, oh, okay. so everybody knows what a source is, right? Source is a polite word for, for a snitch, a rat, a stinker, and all that. Okay. The source provides information to the case officer. The case officer talks to the commander, and in the IDF and Israel Defense Forces, the commander needs to speak to the legal advisor. Why? Because. So when I served as a legal advisor of the Gaza Strip, I, for better or for worse, was the person who was getting those god-awful phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning that go like this. this. And the person who would call me is the commander. The commander would say to me the following. The intelligence community just called me, like now, that based on what the source said to them, the person identified as the target will be in my you know, zone of, of combat, my theater, shortly. And according to the source, this individual poses an immediate and direct threat to Israeli national security. Do I have your permission to <coughs> engage? Engage is not to, you know, engage, but to engage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but note the following. Four actors were speaking three different languages. <clears throat> Why three different languages? The source speaks to the case officer in Arabic, and I don't know if any of you have professional experience with sources, I don't know. 
I don't know if any of you have ever been sources. Don't tell me if you have been. <laughs> but sources don't speak like we do. It's a language unto its own. So he's speaking not only Arabic, he's speaking source Arabic. The case officer is the trigger, he's the linchpin, he's the pivot. He takes source Arabic, translates that into Hebrew to the, for the commander, and the commander then calls me. Now, note, this is, I don't remember from evidence, this is either double hearsay or a triple hearsay, right? <laughs> Neither the commander nor I will have the right to speak to the source. We don't know the source's name. We don't know who the source is. The, because we believe, and anybody who's been involved in intelligence gathering knows that source protection is the holy grail of this business. Because an outed source is a killed source. So we don't know his name. We I don't, this, don't even know his you know, code name or his code number. Please. Were you in the military when you were a legal advisor or were you a civilian? No, sir, 19 years in the IDF. So have uh, you outranked the commander? No. Okay. no. But that's not relevant, and I'll tell you why. It's a great question. In the IDF chain of command, I'm not in this chain of command, unlike in the U.S. military. The U.S. military, the JAGs in the chain of command of, of, of commanders. We're not. We're outside their chain of command. We're only under the, under the, chief, under the judge advocate general. Which means, for instance, he can't order me to come to a meeting. He can only invite me to a meeting. But he has to call me for these things. So here are the questions I asked him. I said, based on what the case officer told you, how reliable is the source? How credible is the information? Is there possible harm to you know, collateral damage innocent individuals? How grave of a risk does this individual pose in terms of proportionality and military necessity? When was the last time the unit, your unit, because they're now in the field, this is happening in real time at 3 o'clock in the morning. When was the last time the unit engaged in a nighttime ambush? Here I have to ask, how many of you ever shot a, fired a gun? Have you ever fired a gun at night? Agree with me, nighttime is not daytime? Those of you who have not fired a gun, I don't mean this disrespectfully, you can't understand the difference between firing a gun at night as compared to the day. Our guys are now, you know, they've laid out an ambush. So I wanted to know when was the last time that they had a nighttime ambush. I also wanted to know if the unit had had disciplinary problems. Why is that an important question? Because if they've had disciplinary questions, issues, it means they're spending too much time disciplining and not enough time training. I also wanted to know where are you, you the commander? Are you in the field? Are you in the office? Are you at home? I'm at home, by the way. Three o'clock in the morning, I should have started off. When he called me at three o'clock in the morning, the conversation was like this, you know, Giora, were you sleeping? And the answer, if you've ever seen in the military, what's the answer? No. no, I was waiting for the phone call. That's the correct <laughs> answer. So I wanted to know if I say that this is, you know, this meets various tests of, of, of legality, are you the one who's going to be pulling the trigger? Are you going to have some other dude pulling the trigger? And he assured me that he himself was there, and he himself had the guy, as we're speaking, he's the one who had him in his scope. I also wanted to know what was in the bag, because the, the point of the story, not the point of the story, but the, the reason for the call, the reason for making this decision was because of what he purportedly, according to the source, had in his bag posed an extraordinary and immediate danger to Israeli national security. Please don't ask me what was in the bag, because obviously you know, I'm going to have to fudge a little bit. Here's what the source had said, that the target will be wearing blue jeans and blue pants. I don't know how many of you ever looked at nighttime vision in the military, but what color is everything? Green. green. <coughs> so the only, only moment of levity was when I asked the guy, how green are the blue jeans? But that's the only moment of levity. <laughs> I had, with this commander, a cordial working relationship. We were not friends. We were not bosom buddies. You know, I, I think there was mutual respect. Something in his voice told me that he's not convinced that this guy is this guy. Now, note, this is back in the, whenever it was in the mid-90s, so I'm not, I can't see him, I can't see anything other than the damn phone that I'm holding. I obviously <coughs> have been through the routine before, obviously I've been around the block on counterterrorism decisions. What interested me was getting a sense from him, when he had him, if what he saw indeed on a one-to-one on -one basis absolutely represented what the case officer said, what the source said would be the situation. For every question, and we lawyers love to ask questions, for every question that I ask, I get an answer. Every answer leads to a different set of questions. And at some point, you know, he's saying to me, you know, Yala, you know, you've got to decide, right? Can't go on forever because as I'm asking questions, the guy's walking. And at some point, he's going to be out of his, 
you know, out of his scope, out of his zone. And obviously, what worries us is the following. One, and I can't emphasize this strongly enough, the issue of collateral damage. The possible harm to innocent individuals. I have to emphasize that a million different times because then you have to ask yourself, is it, lack of a better word, in a cost-benefit analysis, is it worth it? How much of a danger does it pose in terms of how many people, innocent people, you might kill? Two, the second most important question to ask is, what are the alternatives? Why don't you go arrest the guy? Um, a, a bad guy, purported bad guy who you've captured is going to be much more um, information providing than a dead guy. It's understand that the people who are dead generally don't provide information. And his response was the following, and note the complexity of all of this. International law does not require the commander, and I quote, to unduly endanger the lives of his soldiers. We all know Tennyson's famous poem, right? Ours is not to do it, ours is not to wonder why, ours but to do and die. Okay. I wanted to know though, if approaching this guy is going to unduly harm the soldiers. His response to that was, I have no problem detaining him, but based on what the source said in terms of what's in the bag, he says, I'm not willing to take that risk. And when he explained to me what's, according to the source, in the bag, I said, I, I, I agree. I'm comfortable with that one. Next, you, I asked him, if it's true what's in the bag, do you, as the commander, as the trigger puller, believe that this individual indeed poses an immediate and grave danger to national security? And once we both figure out if indeed this, if, but you know, if is a huge word, nebulous. If what was in the bag is correct, then I absolutely agreed with him that this would justify from the perspective of military necessity and proportionality that I would say that yes. At the end of this, oh, somewhere between two to five minute long conversation. That's how long it takes. I told the commander that the answer is no. And the reason I said no to the commander is the following. I was not convinced, based on what he was telling me, that this guy was this guy. More than that, I, something told me in how he was describing the situation that this guy was not this guy, in terms of what he was seeing. But it didn't quite fit, the, the scenario didn't quite fit. So I said to the commander, whose name is not important, I need to add parenthetically, he himself was subsequently killed by a sniper, but unrelated. Um, I said no, he said to Dawaba, the way he said to me, that, you know, done, Roger out, told me that he was comfortable with my decision. Now, you as lawyers need to ask me the following question. Could he ignore my advice? Could he say, well, you know, I called Giora, and Giora said no, but, you know, Giora's sitting in the cupboard of his living room, what the hell does he know, what does he see? Could he ignore my advice? The answer, of course, like any of you, all of you have clients, does a client have to do what you recommend to them? The answer is no. Would he have ignored my advice? The answer is no. Which may, means then, and this is where it gets particularly complex, is in no way, shape, or form do I stand before you and say, I was the decision maker. Absolutely not. What would the consequences be of ignoring your advice? Uh, if I was right and it was the wrong hit, he'd be uh, invited for a very unpleasant conversation. Reprimanded, court martial. I mean, it'd be pretty up bad stuff. What if he was right? If, I would, if he was right and I was wrong, then, um, then, you know, good for him. But the reality of the situation is in this complicated relationship between JAGs and commanders, I can't count on one hand and I've been involved, right, I told you, I've been around the block. Can't count on more than one finger where my advice was not acted on at the end of the day, my recommendation, which was initially um, refused, was that then they acted on in a very complicated and complex military operation. So I've never had my, at the end of the day, never had my recommendations rejected. Um, which raises a really important question in the context of rights. That's why I use this vignette as a rights discussion. Who's the protector of rights and who's to determine whose rights are to be protected? It's not some vague, amorphous question. Is it for the commander to determine whose rights are to be protected and how are they to be protected? Is it for the lawyer to do so? Is it for the system to do so? And what do you do if you're confronted literally on the fly with the requirement to make decisions that aren't necessarily perfectly you know, put into a neat and narrow box? So I stand before you and suggest the following as food for thought, or while you're eating lunch as food for, as food for thought. <laughs> One, this is extraordinarily dynamic. 
when you all went to law school and we all went to law school, life was much easier. States were engaged in war with states. Planes were shooting down planes. Tanks were kill shooting tanks. Submar submarines, submarines, soldiers killing soldiers. Like G.I. Joe, <coughs> killing G.I. Joe. I mean, how easy was life back then? The not war paradigm, what we in Israel call armed conflict short of war, is absolutely and totally different from the war paradigm. We're talking about states engaged in not war, but conflict with non-states. Therefore, the term armed conflict short of war. That's the official Israeli articulation of this present conflict called armed conflict short of war. Ask me how this term was created. It was created on a Friday afternoon in the office of the Judge Advocate General. On, the, on that following Sunday, my colleagues had to go before the Israeli Supreme Court to try to articulate what the hell is this paradigm. And what they came up with in English was armed conflict short of war. Ask me what armed conflict short of war means. And I'll tell you what, it's not war, it's between state and non-state. Ask me exactly what are the parameters, and I'll tell you, here are some suggestions as to the parameters. This is the only way to really get into the rights discussion. One, you have to articulate and define who's the legitimate target. Who can you lawfully engage with? And how far does the legitimate target go? So, by vignette. Suicide bombings. Everybody knows about suicide bombings. Say yes. Have any of you ever been? Have any of you ever been to Israel and actually seen the aftermath of the suicide bombing? Well, it's pretty horrific, right? Okay. To make a suicide bombing happen, there are four distinct actors who are responsible for a suicide bombing operation. Actor number one is the one who does this. You know, the uh, the, the bomber, the he or she who detonates themselves, or the person who detonates the bomber. You know, not all bombers detonate are self detonate. Some are detonated by by remote. Okay, so that's actor number one. Actor number two is the quarterback of the team. You know, Jay Cutler, the, I, not Jay Cutler, but you know, the quarterback of the team, the one who puts it all together. He's responsible for, for you know, recruiting people, drafting people, putting the organization together, identifying the targets, identifying where you want to do the hit, and so on. He's the quarterback, or she's the quarterback. Actor number three is the person responsible for logistics. Logistics are essentially the driver who brings the suicide bomber to the, you know, to the coffee house, the one who makes the suicide belt, the one who puts the suicide belt on. And the fourth person, for all you lawyer types, the fourth person is the most interesting one. Who's the fourth person? No, ma'am. Plan is the quarterback. The financier. Financier. All right. Now, four distinct actors, A, B, C, D. It's not A or B. It's A and B and C and D. It's need all four to make a suicide bombing occur. Now, let's ask yourselves, who's the legitimate target? And once you answer who's the legitimate target, ask yourself, when are they a legitimate target? So I have to say, well, okay, so he's a legitimate target. The Israeli model says the following. The suicide bomber, the one who's about to walk into you know, the coffee house, the pizza house, the pizza parlor, whatever, he's a suicide, he's a legitimate target as he's approaching the thing. You know, once he has the belt on and he's good to go. But not the day before when he says, you know, I'm going to do this because that's still too vague. The whole idea of this rights-based paradigm, which I'm an absolute and firm believer in, you can absolutely engage in aggressive self-defense provided you apply it narrowly and specifically. So as he's about to go to the pizza parlor, as he's you know, out of the car, been let out of the car, and there's no alternative, you can't arrest him for a variety of complex operational reasons, it's the only way to prevent it from anything from happening, he then is an absolutely legitimate target. But I want you to note, please, there's a discussion in the academy as to whether or not I'm right, and let me give you an example from a colleague of mine who thinks that I'm absolutely dead wrong. I mean, totally wrong. A colleague of mine says the following, that you can only, and I quote, you can only kill a suicide bomber, and I quote, after they've done the act. Hmm? And, and to which I responded, as far as I know, once the suicide bomber has done the act, <laughs> they're dead. Hello. And, but there is this discussion, which you need to be sensitive to in the context of, of rights. How far back do you go with self-defense? Right? There's a, there's a tension. All right. Category number two, the planner, the quarterback, the guy who makes all this happen. He is a legitimate target 24-7. Whether he's asleep in his bed, whether he's eating food, having breakfast, or whether he's actually planning. Provided, wait, it's not that simple, that you absolutely make every effort to minimize the collateral damage. And I'll give you an example where it didn't work very well. There was a guy who's a bad guy. His name is Shkada. Shkada was the um, Hamas operative in Gaza who was planning, those of you who have been to Israel, you know, when you're about to land in Tel Aviv, you've seen our, our, our World Trade Center buildings, right? Okay. He was going to blow up all three. But 
He would never blow it up himself, right? Because these guys don't get their own hands dirty, they send others, but he was the planner. And the decision was made from an operational perspective <coughs> the only, bless you, that the only way to prevent him from going forward was to send him to the world where all is good. The hit was done at night. The hit was done when he was in his house. So far, so good. The problem was it was done by a hellfire missile, you know, a helicopter in the air, zeroes in on him, and he's killed. The problem was the following. The quality of building in, in Gaza is hopefully not like the, build, the quality of building here at DePaul. And so the house imploded. And when the house imploded, all, I don't remember how many children he had, I think he had nine kids, plus, I don't remember the number, I don't want to misquote, I think three or four of his wives were killed. We have 13, between 13 to 16 clearly innocent people killed as a result of this targeted kill. In retrospect, and there's been long discussion in Israel about this targeted kill again, about this one. In retrospect, I think there's pretty wide recognition that even though he was absolutely a legitimate target, he's the, he's the ultimate planner. In retrospect, could have found a better time and place because the window of opportunity between his planning and the act was still broad enough where he could have found a different time to do the hit and to minimize the collateral damage. All right, so that's the planner. Three, the guy responsible for logistics. Is he as bad as the bomber? He's worse. He's one step above. He's the driver. He makes things happen. So he's a legitimate target more broadly than the, than the bomber himself, not as broadly as the planner, somewhere in the middle. And the fourth category is the financier. So those of you who have never dealt with terrorist financiers, I don't know if any of you have. If you have, don't raise your hand. What, what you need to know about terrorist finance, or if any of you finance terrorism, certainly don't raise your hand. What you need to know about terrorist financiers is that they are unbelievably smart. They are sophisticated in a way that is almost impossible for us to understand is how sophisticated they are. Quick story about this. I met with the vice president of one of America's major banks, where actually many of you may have your money. And he tells me the following story. In November of a particular year, not important which one, he was told by his CEO, because he was VP for business development, that they realized that they had a number of new clients. Numbers of new clients who were wiring money to the Middle East, somewhere around two to three billion dollars. I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's a lot of money. And the CEO says, bring him in for a group and grid Christmas party, and you know, I'll give you a nice bonus, we'll all be really happy with each other. And so the, uh, the vice president for business development is trying to call these guys and bring them all in. Uh, CEO's getting increasingly irritated because it's, it's not happening, it's not happening, it's not happening. Why didn't it happen? This number of people, they thought they had between 10 to 15 new clients. Wrong. One guy had created at one of America's main, major financial institutions 416 fictitious accounts with 416 fictitious names with 416, 416 fictitious social security numbers. One guy wiring between two to three billion dollars to the Middle East. So it tells me the vice president for business development, this is him talking, he's a little bit humorous. He says, my mother had always told me I was the smartest boy in class. And I always believed my mother, because you obviously believe whatever your mom tells you. He says, until I ran up against these guys, he says, we, at this major financial institution, had no idea how smart these guys are, how sophisticated they are, and how they've been able to understand our system. The financier, as legitimate target, makes, by the way, for you in the back, for you over here, a hell of a large article. Totally uncharted territory. When does the financier become a legitimate target? And does he have to be engaged in the actual wiring of money? I need not tell you that the act of wiring money, how long does it take? Two seconds. Two seconds. Ding, enter. So if you say that he's a legitimate target only when he does the <coughs> ding, then he's, you know, he's the, he benefits from that, right? On the other hand, is he as important as the planner? Arguably. Does that mean he's legitimate 24-7? Don't know. Is he more important than the, the guy who detonates? The answer, of course, is yes. So where exactly does he fit in? Unclear, uncharted waters, low-hanging fruits for a great law review article, but in the context of rights. Effective counterterrorism says this guy is absolutely a legitimate target, but you gotta minimize that because otherwise you can go back I began my story, you have just like that. All right, next thing we need to ask ourselves, this term that we keep using, what the hell is terrorism? So if you turn on your TV tonight or however you get your news, you know, uh, Twitter, blogs, schmogs, CNN, NBC, newspapers, right, there's something still called a newspaper, right, okay. <laughs> You'll see a million different dif different definitions of terrorism. So, because we're not together until uh, another 45 minutes, here's my definition of terrorism. Terrorism is an act by an individual or by individuals acting for a cause, for distinct causes, religious, political, social, economic, 
And in order to advance one of those causes, their target are innocent individuals. And in the context of targeting innocent, innocent individuals, they will kill innocent individuals, they will harm innocent individuals, they will cause property damage to innocent individuals, and they will try to intimidate the civilian population from going about their daily lives. <coughs> Meaning from the terrorist organization's perspective, they don't care if they kill this side of the room or this side of the room, as long as something bad happens to innocent individuals. Of the four causes I just mentioned, political, economic, social, and religious, based on my conversations, conversations is a, is a loose word, with thousands of terrorists during the course of my 20 years in the IDF, obviously it was not conversations that were particularly pleasant like this one, the fundamental, not the only, but the primary cause of terrorism in our age today is without a doubt religious extremism. Note, I didn't say it's the only cause, but I come to you based, again, I don't know how many, with how many of these guys I've talked, thousands. Religious extremism poses the fundamental motivator today for terrorism. One of the most important questions, if we have time we'll get into this also, is how, what do you do with religious extremism? So that's what terrorism is. What's counter-terrorism? There are two distinct strands or branches to counter-terrorism. One is what is called operational counter-terrorism. Operational counter-terrorism is a fancy word for detaining somebody, imposing sanctions on them, or if need be, killing them. But operational counter-terrorism sounds more, you know, plain. The other form of counter-terrorism is what's called soft counter-terrorism. Soft counter-terrorism is financing, um, building hospitals, building schools, refinancing various downtrodden communities, ec economies, in order to do the following. There are, I suggest, three distinct lines in life today. Line number one is out here. Those are people who are standing opposite the recruiting poster, you know, the Osama bin Ladens of the world, who believe that the only way to, for the human existence to actually you know, do its thing is to be a terrorist. On the other side, over here, are people who believe that terrorism is god awful. The third line, this middle line, what is referred to as the swayables, is the single most important line in the world today. Soft counter-terrorism is directed at them in order to show them that if we rebuild schools, build hospitals, economies, and up, that we will convince them to go to the good side rather than to the bad side. But what's the downside with all this? Every time you engage in operational counterterrorism and you do a mishit where you have collateral damage, like the shahada hit, what you have done then is you've taken the swayables and put them over here. It's extremely difficult for the swayables to be convinced to go over here when they see that our counterterrorism goes too far over here. The long-term impact effect of what I call negative counterterrorism or from our perspective, negative counterterrorism is extraordinary. A couple of quick examples. I take you back to Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib right the bed and breakfast in, in Iraq. I take you back to Lindy England, that was the American service woman who was absolutely, you know, humiliating the Iraqis, you know, walking them like dogs, the fake menstruation, fondling her breasts and all that. While President Bush was talking about bring democracy to the Middle East, the people in the Middle East saw American service woman, American service personnel, humiliating slash torturing people living in the Middle East. The disconnect was extraordinary. And what happens in the context of this disconnect is that the swayables say they're BSing us because what they're really all about is this violent counterterrorism, which at the end of the day leads them to go to over here. What then is the significance of all this in the rights-based paradigm? That while I'm a firm believer in the state's right to engage in self-defense based on Article 51 of the UN Charter, the question is, what are the limits of self-defense? And against whom can you act preemptively? So let's look at some examples of preemptiveness. I take you back to the 1967 Six-Day War. I think you, most of us, never say all, most of us would say that the combination of the following, Nasser's threats to you know, send the Jews into the sea, the closing of the Straits of Tehran, the, the positioning of Egyptian soldiers, large units on the, on the, on the um, in Sinai, that could have been construed clearly as an almost as an act of war, justified Israel's actions <coughs> that Monday morning. That's example one. Example two is the Iraqi nuclear reactor, which is no longer with us thanks to the Israel Defense Forces, um, May 1981. A nuclear reactor in Iran, which is about to become operational, particularly given Saddam Hussein's threats with respect to Israel, note the following. The day that the, that the IDF, or the IAF, the Israel Air Force, bombed the nuclear reactor, blew it to smithereens. Every law review article written worldwide, with one exception, lambasted Israel. 
One exception. The only, only academic who came to Israel's defense is a guy named Timothy McCormick, who's Australian. All other academics across the board, left, right, center, whatever country in the world, accused Israel of violating Iraqi sovereignty, of acting preemptively, preemptively, and not giving Iraq due notice of whatever. 30 years later, right, 30 years later, I would imagine that hopefully, but never say hopefully, those who wrote those law review articles must say to themselves, well, we got that one wrong. But what has gone undefined, not undiscussed, but undefined, is the right to self-defense with respect to non-state actors. Because we have not sufficiently addressed when do they pose a threat that justifies the state action against them, and how far can the state go? So the obvious poster child for this discussion, obviously, is Operation Cast Lead from 2008. Take you all back, after, the, after Israel disengages from the Gaza Strip, Hamas wins the election. By the way, free and democratic election, there's no doubt about that. I mean, that's seriously not cynical. The next thing, the first thing I ran to all of us, the first thing Hamas did after they won the election, the very first thing they did, was they destroyed all the greenhouses that Israel had left for them. And the reason they destroyed all the greenhouses, one, two reasons. One is to destroy all vestiges of occupation. The second, one is far more, the second reason is far more nefarious. Those greenhouses were an important source of, of employment opportunities for Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. By destroying those greenhouses, what Hamas did, I mean, it's nefarious beyond nefarious, is they made the Gazans dependent on them for financial largesse. But don't think that it's, you know, like health, education, welfare. The reason you make a population dependent on you financially, that's the easiest way, note, it's the easiest way to recruit suicide bombers. Because then you pay the families. So you make people financially dependent on you, you gave, you, you bring in their oldest or their whichever son they give you, turn them into a suicide bomber, and then you pay them. Also, please note, don't forget that Saddam Hussein in the good old days, when he had money, when he was still alive, I believe it was $50,000 for a successful attack and $10,000 for an unsuccessful attack. <coughs> question? I was going to, isn't it also true that they use the scrap metal for Samurai. I think most of the scrap metal that's being stolen in Israel today goes to China. <laughs> Actually, well, that's not Israel, no, but the, the scrap metal. Being, by the way, the scrap metal being stolen in Israel all the time. And I, I don't know about Gaza, but it goes to China. I don't know about the Gaza. The irony of you know, the irony of irony. Okay. So the next thing Hamas does is it undertakes this constant firing of Qassam missiles into Israel. Depends who you want to believe, but the number seems to be somewhere around 10,000 missiles were fired into Israel over a two to three year period. The range of a Qassam missile is plus minus 40 kilometers. If you look at a map of Israel, 40 kilometers this way, this way, this way, means that 600,000 Israelis were in harm's way on a daily basis. That is about 9% of the Israeli population. I'm not very good at math, but if there are 300 million Americans, and if 9% of 300 million, that's more than five Americans. The Israeli government we can have a long discussion about whether it was right to wait, not right to wait. It's a whole different discussion. But at the end of the day, the government, the Omer government decides an operation cast lead, boom, and here comes the cavalry. Open secret, the pictures from Operation Cast Lead in the context of rights, right? We're talking about rights. The pictures were not pretty, right? We can all agree. But you need to ask yourselves the following questions. If a community, if the over you know, one has to be careful with numbers, but clearly to make the Qassam infrastructure work took significant active and passive support alike from the Gazan population, who were Hamas members, those who were Hamas members. And note the following, to make those 10,000 missiles possible, that day in, day out, note the following. Here too we have magically four different actors responsible for this. Also a great law review article. One are those who were smuggling the missiles in from Egypt into, into Gaza. Have any of you ever been, this is not a trick question, have any of you ever been to Gaza? Have any of you ever seen the tunnels? I spent, when I was the legal advisor of the Gaza Strip, I spent a day with Mufaz, when Mufaz was the um, officer in command of the Southern Command. Mufaz, myself, and there's a, real, there's a professional in life called Tunnel Detector. It's not a joke. And this Tunnel Detector, Mufaz and I spent a day, this guy is lugging around, it was in the middle of the summer, he's schlepping all this god-awful equipment, and he's going like this, just like in the movies. 
And he says, I know we're standing on a tunnel. And I can't detect it. The reason I bring that to your attention is how extremely sophisticated these tunnels are. One tunnel had an underground hospital. I mean, this is sophisticated stuff. And those of us who are of age go back to, you know, the Vietnam War. It's exactly, it's a North Vietnamese model in terms of tunnels and underground hospitals. It's the exact same model. So there are the smugglers. Category number two are the missile makers in Gaza. There were missile, missile making factories in the Gaza Strip. Rather than making you know, something viable economically, I guess it's better to have a missile making industry. Category number three are the shooters. Those guys who run around and fire the rocket launchers and off they go. And the fourth category is the most complicated one and the most problematic one. It's the landowners from whose land the rockets were being fired. So if you think about who's a legitimate target, I will tell you, a rocket maker, he's a legitimate target. I have no problem. The guy firing the missile, I sure as hell hope that he's being killed. Well, I mean, it's either you or me, right? There's a zero-sum game in this business. The, the smuggler, he's not a good guy. The landowner raises really important questions as to the distinction from the perspective of the law between a passive supporter and an active support. What we decided was the following. Problematic. If we can show based on intelligence information that the landowner willingly was letting missiles be fired from his land, from his property, that makes him a legitimate target. If, on the other hand, we knew from intelligence information that they were forcing themselves on him, and God knows these people have their way to force themselves on you, that he's not a legitimate target. So the, the test comes down to intelligence information. Hang on. Go back to how I began with my target killing vignette about the source. The, the importance of the source cannot be minimized. But I will take you back to how Operation Cast Lead began on that Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. It began with a deliberate attack on Palestinian policemen participating in a graduation ceremony of the Gaza police when they were unarmed. That's how Operation Castle began. Now, why did it begin like that? It wasn't by chance. I mean, this was, we knew, obviously, that those who needed to know knew about the graduation ceremony and it was attacked. Why was it attacked? The thinking went like this. It was essential in the context of aggressive, underlined, counterterrorism to come to Hamas and say the rules of the game have changed. And here's the distinction from a legal perspective. Until then, until that Saturday morning, Israeli counterterrorism what it was what is referred to as person-specific counterterrorism. <clears throat> Operation Castled changes that. This is now not person-specific. This is organization-specific. Is there a difference from the perspective of rights between person-specific and organization-specific? The answer, of course, is yes, obviously. It raised, and it should have raised, and it's good that it raised, very important questions about what is proportionality, not state-state, but state-non-state. Again, note the difference. The question that we need to ask ourselves in the context of this rights-based discussion is what is proportionality, not state-state, but state-non-state. So people like me will tell you the following. There is no proportionality in the state-non-state discussion. There can't be proportionality, because I have, thank God, F-16s, and they have Qassam missiles. So the proportionality is, is, is a term used by, sorry, the media, and it's a misused term. It's, it's, it's intellectually and practically incorrect. There's inherent disproportionality between states and non-states. The question that needs to be asked and needs to be re-articulated, reframed, is, is the state using its weapons proportionally to the threat posed? Not in the context of the threat posed by the Nazi, but what, how are they going to best protect themselves? And here's what Operation Castlet said. Passive and active supporters alike of Hamas to make this 10,000 missile thing happen, both categories are now legitimate targets. And in order to protect the state of Israel and the 600,000 people living within 40 kilometers, proportional use of the F-16s or the helicopters justifies attacking not the individual, but those affiliated, aligned, supporting, facilitating Hamas. 
It's a very different paradigm, but no. There are obviously problems with this expansiveness because it potentially leads you to expand it so far that you are no longer being careful in terms of defining yes organization, no organization. It also means that your intelligence information must be spot on because if it's not spot on, you're going to absolutely, without a doubt, be engaging in, magical word, collateral damage. I take you back to discussion last week at Harvard Law School with the Assistant Secretary of, I don't remember, Assistant Secretary of State, Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, Brennan, who gave a talk at Harvard Law School, <coughs> in which he articulated the Obama administration's take on the drone policy and how it's being implemented. Old people like me who've been involved in these kinds of decisions read it, and I don't have any hair that can stand up, but if I had hair, it would have stood up. And here's why. Because the policy that was articulated is the following. We will attack, quote, if there's a likelihood that the target is a member of a terrorist organization. The word likelihood is the critical word here. So when you ask yourself, what does the word likelihood mean? The answer is, who the hell knows what likelihood means? And if you've expanded it so far that there's likelihood that people who are in a group, now we're talking about the people standing around together, if there's a likelihood that they're members of an organization they hereby have been defined by the Obama administration as legitimate targets. I find that to be, frankly, deeply distressing because what it means is, magical phrase, it is a criteria-less counter-terrorism policy. I have no idea what likelihood means. And in that hand, just one word, word. In that, to that end, um, last year NPR sponsored a one-hour debate discussion between the, the former head of the CIA office in Iraq, the guy who personally was just, actually in real life, this is the guy who found Saddam Hussein, and myself on the drone policy. And here's what I said. I said that I'm in favor of the drone policy provided that there are criteria, that there are criteria, and there are criteria. I was amazed by his response. You know, everybody has their final word on these lovely shows. What's it called, like, not face the nation, around the nation, whatever that great NPR show is. He said at the end, and this is a guy who has been there, right? He, said, he says with sadness that he totally agrees with me on two fronts. One, that I'm absolutely right about this need for criteria in the context of rights. And two, he's sad to say that we here in the United States have not really had this criteria-based discussion in the context of how you articulate legitimate target and how you implement the definition of legitimate target. The discussion last week at Harvard about this likelihood of, of membership, I read that, I said, oh my God, sir. Is this a difference in policy uh, from the prior administration? In other words, did the Obama administration change the drone policy from the Bush administration, or was it a continuation? Because I believe in numbers, even though when I was in eighth grade, my, the math teacher told my parents that math and Amos will never go together, but I do get the numbers a little bit. The Obama administration has exponentially increased the number of drone attacks off the chart. They've made it very clear that this is going to be the policy going forward. Now, there, there, there are justifiable, justifiable reasons for the drone policy. It absolutely minimizes you know, putting your own soldiers in harm's way. It's a cleaner, whatever the hell that word means. But the Obama administration has um, took the Bush policy this to this. Um, in my computer, I actually have all the numbers, all the attacks. It's just exponentially off the charts. Here's the problem. We're in September, right? Okay. Two months ago, those of you who follow this carefully, you should have been bemused when the CIA announced and the New York Times reported the New York Times never lies. <laughs> no, that was serious. The CIA reported that there's not been one case of collateral damage in Afghanistan, Iraq, sorry, Afghanistan or Pakistan. Now, you need to put on your cynical hat and say, it's impossible. I'm sorry? I said it's impossible. Yeah. Well, that's very, you're very polite. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Keep not. going. <laughs> but it's not impossible if you use that likelihood. Exactly. <clears throat> Good for you. Yeah. That's the punchline. But here was the punchline of the punchline. <clears throat> Two months ago, when the CIA came out, and the New York Times reported CIA claims, right? Okay. And what disturbed me, again, I don't want to beat up on anybody, but it really disturbed me. Disturbed is probably word for distressed. That the New York Times didn't bash it. I mean, it's impossible. And the CIA should have asked exactly what you just hit the touchdown, the home run. 
Well, of course there's no collateral damage if everybody's likely. <laughs> then there is no collateral damage. That, meaning, going forward in terms of rights, there is no more collateral damage. Right? Okay. To your question about the Obama administration, that's going to tie back to a question that was asked at the very beginning. There are X number of different parameters to counterterrorism, but I want to focus on three. Right? <clears throat> One is detention policy. Two is interrogation policy. And third is the basis, the objective standards for determining whether or not someone can be detained. In the context of counterterrorism in the United States, and some of you will get irritated with me, but how did the French say? Say look. In the context of American counterterrorism, the standards with respect to counterterrorism are skimpy at best. We have not really had an articulation of when somebody is a legitimate candidate for detention. I'm talking about domestic uh, terrorism outside the United States. The problem with that is that we've detained, I'll get into numbers in a second, X number of people based on what a, an individual said about them. And those of you who have been involved in the intelligence community know that sources are problematic. Sources, X percentage of sources have, you know, they're ratting on people because they have grudges, they're wrong clan, somebody messed with somebody's sister, and so on, so on, so on. And if you don't have criteria when somebody is a legitimate candidate for detention, then everybody is a legitimate candidate for detention. That's problem number one with detention. Problem number two is there is an insufficient, meaning, a less than rigorous process for determining the following, whether or not the individual continues to pose a threat to American national security. There needs to be a two-part test. One, did he, at point of arrest, pose a threat to American national security? And two, does he continue to pose a threat to American national security? Somebody asked me about the habeas. You bet that in terms of the habeas, the fact that there's not rigorous, consistent, robust judicial review by the independent judiciary of the detainees who have been detained overseas that, to me, absolutely violates both morality and the law. As I stand before you on this lovely Wednesday <coughs> afternoon, depending on what, whose statistics you want to believe, but roughly speaking, roughly speaking, there are 20,000 individuals detained in Abu, Abu Ghraib and Bagram, and some also floating around the world in the Sixth Fleet. 20,000. What are the criteria for their continued detention? Who knows? Are there people who've been in detention for X years who have not seen a, a judge? The answer is yes. There have been various attempts, the combatant status review tribunals, the combatant this, the board this, and the board that. No consistent policy with rigorous standards has been implemented. I find that both immoral and illegal. That's detention. And not to, not to bash pre either this president or that president, but neither the former president nor the current president have, are, have taken the time to articulate standards for detention. That's point one. Interrogation. So I, the assumption that all of you know what waterboarding is, so everybody knows what waterboarding is right now. So one would like to believe, and one was, likes to be optimistic on this, that waterboarding no longer occurs. But I need to tell you something about waterboarding and, and the problem is. When I was teaching at Case Western Reserve before I went to Utah, um, I wrote an article, was writing an article, about the limits of interrogation, which then turned into a book, and I don't know to this day how, don't know, okay? Interrogators in Afghanistan heard that I was writing, this goes to your question, interrogators in Afghanistan found out that I was writing this book. Don't know how, it didn't come for me. I was getting these extraordinary emails from interrogators asking to meet with me when they came stateside. And you would ask yourself, how is it that an interrogator, when he's in Afghanistan, why would you come meet with some law professor in Cleveland? There are far more interesting things to do when you come home than to meet with some goddamn law professor, right? They would come to Cleveland. They would meet with me. There were three conditions to my meeting. One, that they would come with somebody who I believe was their lawyer. Two, you know, the shutters had to be closed and the door had to be closed. And three, they all had the same first name, Jim. I don't know, maybe all interrogators are named Jim. They all told me the same thing. One, they had all witnessed waterboarding. Two, they all knew that waterboarding was ineffective. It was what? Ineffective. And three, they wanted to assure me that they themselves had not participated in the waterboarding that they had witnessed. <laughs> and I said to them, you know, I'm not your father confessor. I'm not the, I'm not the, I'm not the Wailing Wall. I'm not the thing somewhere else. 
I asked myself, why did they come to meet with me? I mean, I don't think I'm really that interesting. Why come meet with me? And here's what I was subsequently told to your question. They came to meet with me because they felt that senior command and senior political leadership was ignoring them, was hanging them out in the proverbial clothesline, that nobody was giving them written specific instructions as to the limits of interrogation, and therefore their senior interrogators were giving them the magical word. This is what they were telling me all the time. Do, and the phrase is, do whatever you have to do to get the information. Well, duh, will good things happen? The answer, of course, is not. What they were really imploring me to do was to become, and I was you know, humble, to become their voice, and to turn to leadership, Congress, the executive branch, and to articulate or to put a framework out there for the limits of interrogation. Troubled me, and troubles me, that you know, moi, me, little old law professor, becomes the voice of the interrogator. I mean, it is, take my word for it, it's deeply humbling. It really is. When, when did this take place? Uh, 2006. Six. Right. It's deeply humbling. Um, and I'm deeply respectful. We, I, by the way, we all <laughs> owe them a huge thank you. Not because they came to me, because of what they do. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shitty job. But the fact that they felt that nobody was giving them objective guidelines, that's the problem. Are they, just one more word. Are there objective guidelines today, and does torture still continue? Today? That's really what you're asking. Washington Post had an article last year by Dana Priest, and if you want to know what's really happening, read Dana Priest in the Washington Post. She gets it all right, which is why she wins the Pulitzer's, and she's the best of the best. There was an article last year, last fall, that some torture is still going on with respect to what is euphemistically referred to as high-value detainees. That article by Dana Priest was never refuted by the administration. One more word, and then one. Happy to have the third thing is where to try these guys. Washington Post. Washington Post. Where to try them. There are four options where to try terrorists. Option number one are Article Three courts, which all of you know inside outside. Option number two is the military commissions in Guantanamo, which has been a resounding success. Option number three is not to try them. And option number four is to do something which I have testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee recommending, and that's creation and articulation of a national security court. The numbers are overwhelming. Whether it's 20,000 or 10,000 or 15,000, we have to make a decision. Are we going to deny people their day in court? Or are we going to say, well, so we've got to create some kind of an infrastructure? Mosawi was going to be brought to trial in the um, District Court of New York. That's what the Attorney General of the United States said. And then the mayor of New York, Bloomberg, said, you never consulted me, the security costs are overwhelming, and no, this is not going to be possible. The President of the United States, who I think has other things to do, so I'm told, busy guy, economy, yes, said he himself will decide. I thought to myself, it can't be. It can't be that we have no system in place. And it requires the president to overrule his attorney general and to say, I will decide where people will be tried. I mean, it tells me that there, we have missed the boat fundamentally in creating this systematic rights paradigm where all these issues should have been addressed, have not been addressed. Sir, your question. Um, at the very outset, when you postulated your topic as including an analysis of um, uh, rights, mm -hmm. I believe that the operative phrase, and I don't need to put words in your mouth, but it was important to me, I was think I was listening carefully, was that you believe that the uh, targets, the parties, the prisoners, whoever they might be, have rights. Yes, sir. And then you explained some of them respect to our Constitution, uh, extraterritoriality, and various other criteria. Um, you went on and spoke more about other aspects, uh, mainly in terms of application of ideas. Correct. And then you started to use the phrase again that they have rights with regard to some of the incidents that you had uh, explained. Mm -hmm. And that these rights, again, you said were something that you believed in. Correct. It was apparent, it was my thinking at that moment, that you were saying about uh, the subject matter, 
something that to me was extremely uncomfortable from a legal standpoint. And that what I had hoped to hear you say was that um, uh, it wasn't something you believed in, as though, let's say, do you believe in God or not, which is never provable, but rather uh, more do you believe in the fact that uh, speeding over the above uh, designated speed limit is actually unlawful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you ever reached that point. And now in your most recent remarks, and I don't mean to be you know, kind of breaking into the talk, but no, it's been something I've been trying to listen to throughout. Um, you said that um, it's incredible to you, looking over the field as you have, mm -hmm. that all these things are called jumble, Correct. and they're all up in the air, Correct. and every decision is almost ad hoc, Correct. and the criteria are blurred at best, or else non-existent based on your knowledge. Correct. And um, with all of that, my response is as much a question as it is a kind of a, an observation, something that's kind of been on my mind for a long time. Uh, having uh, practiced for uh, 30, 40 years, uh, it was always my objective to be able to go to court and whatever the judge's attitude, style, belief, experience might be, is to say to him, this is the law. I prepare, I study, so on and so forth. And my purpose in court here is to explain to you the application of the law to my client's factual situation. I actually agree with everything you said. Here's the problem. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, it's unacceptable to me, I mean, in a nice, pleasant conversation, no, no. that uh, no, you're you, the table. as a lawyer, can speak about this subject and talk about it more or less in anecdotal terms without addressing what is the obvious and fundamental flaw to my way of fighting. And that, and that is that there's been an obligation from the very onset, either in the executive branch by executive order, or in the Congress by legislative fiat to articulate the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis any one or more of these uh, problems. And to have said, this is our law. Right. And if somebody's got a grievance, let him go to the district court and the appellate court and the federal court. And if right. he doesn't have a grievance, let him propagandize, as most people do. Right. And let us, in the meantime, say, this is what it is. So, and people can criticize the United States for being uh, overreaching. After all, you're going beyond the domestic borders of the United States. Uh, you're going into the air. You're going into the mineral um, base below the ground and all that kind of stuff. Who do you think you are kind of criteria might be applied. But in my view, the United States had from the very onset an obligation to articulate what the situation was instead of passing the buck to a military court, to a federal district court, <coughs> or to any other ad hoc uh, organization that they might establish in the face of this flow of constant legal issues and leaving people such as yourself who are experienced, educated, and all the rest <coughs> to kind of say, I believe that this is the law, but not being able to come as I would if I were going to present the case and say, this is the law, I based get, on my having prepared my research. Got it. Okay. So here's the, here's the response. First of all, everything you said is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Two, the fundamental problem is that we have failed to create a body of laws in the context of the state, not state action. That's the problem. But hang on. One of the remarkable failures, this goes back to the question over here, 10 years later, post 9-11, in many ways, we're still having, the, a, we're having a preliminary discussion. One of the purposes of, of, of talks like this is to do exactly what, and you're right to pick up on this, and I congratulate you on this. I say that respectfully and seriously. To pick up on the fact that on these four critical issues, detention, interrogation, trial, and call it operational counterterrorism, we have failed. We as a society, it's easy to blame the presidency. Congress is not, believe me, as someone who testifies in front of Congress, Congress is non-existent. And I will also go one step further with you and say the Supreme Court has, has ducked on these issues for the past 10 years, just like it's ducked every time there's national security questions. The question is, in the context of rights, which I assume by now you figure out this rights discussion is important for me. People like me who, and I'm obviously not the only one, who really believe in this are struggling with trying to articulate a series of laws, not in the state-state paradigm, which is easy because we've, you know, we've been through the drill, but in this new paradigm. And, and the fundamental reality is that we don't have. And that's how we can have people held in, a, in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, 
denied habeas because we have not in any way created what you would call, and I would agree with you, a body of laws. And the question then becomes, in the context of when you don't have a body of laws, how do you create a rights-based paradigm, not ad hoc, but on in an institutionalized basis? In the United States, we haven't done that. That's the bottom line truth. In Israel, hang on. In Israel, what has saved us, and I'm the first one to say having been involved in these decisions, what, you know, we, mistakes are obviously, <coughs> what has saved us in Israel is something that has not occurred here. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Israeli legal system, but in Israel, the Israeli Supreme Court has two hats. One is the Supreme Court, as you know, Supreme Court. And the other hat it wears is something called the High Court of Justice. <coughs> Those of you who are not familiar with the High Court of Justice, one minute explanation. It's based on the British model, so it exists in England, India, and Israel. Any aggrieved individual, any aggrieved individual, Palestinian and or Israeli, you need not, to be, you need not be an Israeli citizen, who feels that the state has or is about to violate your rights broadly defined, has the right to petition the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as the High Court of Justice, and the High Court of Justice will hear your petition not then, but now. That means from the perspective of commanders, they know that every decision they're considering is subject to robust, immediate, vigorous judicial review. If there's anything that has forced you know, the idea to create a workable box in the context of this rights-based discussion, it's the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as, as the High Court of Justice. And let me give you two very brief examples, because this is the way rights are articulated when there's no exact clause in place. I take you all back to 1992 in the aftermath of a series of horrific terrorist attacks done by Hamas. Rabin and Barak, when he was chief of staff, decided to uh, deport 415 um, Hamas operatives from the Gaza Strip. The decision was made in the morning. Colleagues of mine reviewed files of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of Hamas operatives. That night at about 10 o'clock in the morning, the decision, 10 o'clock at night, the decision was made these are the 415 people who are going to be deported from Gaza to Lebanon, right? Not to Egypt, but to Lebanon. Do the math yourself. 400, to deport 415 people, you put about 15 to 20 on a bus, so there are about 20 buses driving from Gaza to Lebanon on Israel's coastal world, right? To deport 415 people also requires having helicopters in the air. Uh, okay. Two o'clock in the morning, word gets somehow got out. I don't know how. A attorney representing somebody went to the house of the, of the Judge Barak, who at the time was the Deputy President of the Israeli Supreme Court, knocked at his door at 2 o'clock in the morning, told Barak there's now, right now, deportation of 450 people on the coastal road of Israel. Barak issued a temporary restraining order. The hearing's at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now do, think about this. There are, the, Israel's coastal road is closed. It's like having Highway 80 closed, right? Or USA. Is that, that's what it's called, USA. Okay. Sorry? I A. All right. Well, I, get, I knew there was an A. Okay. <laughs> the hearing starts at five o'clock in the morning. At two o'clock in the afternoon, Barack issues a holding which says deportation go forward, but only for two years. That moment is for people like me is you know ingrained in our collective memory because what it told us was the following. This goes exactly to what you're asking. The Supreme Court of Israel, again, sitting as the High Court of Justice, literally created laws that put us all in a neat little box as to the limits of interrogation, detention, targeted killing, and um, where to try people. Here in the United States, sorry to you know, get on my high horse, in every su Supreme Court decision since 2001, the Supreme Court has failed to aggressively indicate to the executive branch the limits of executive power with respect to national security. I mean, you got to read between the lines. Look at Hamdi. Look at Justice O'Connor, with all due respect to Justice O'Connor. Read Justice O'Connor and Hamdi. She apologizes to the executive for criticizing the executive. I don't know how many of you have had a seat around the table of the executive branch. but if isn't, it, that, isn't that by implication giving them free reign? Thank you very much. Yes, That's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. But, I mean, we have, we have a rule here that the executive has unlimited power. Right, but the problem with unlimited powers is this unchecked powers. And I think it back to Justice Jackson and Youngstown. The whole idea of the unfettered executive has come back and reared its ugly head all over again. The same thing comes through in, Ham in Hamdan, the same thing comes through in Rasul and um, Padilla. It's over and over again, 
And at least in Hamdi, they said this much. In the other cases, the failure to articulate a clear policy. Where does it all leave us? <coughs> We're not even at home plate. You know, because we don't have the high justice. We have but we have a separate way. We have a separation of powers. We, thank the God we have separation. The executive can do what they want. Well, hang on. It's, it's a long, it's so you and I are going to very respectfully disagree. Yeah. Under no condition whatsoever can the executive branch still be allowed to do whatever it wants to do in the context of national security. Justice Barack wrote, and by the way, those of you who are interested in this context of judicial review and armed conflict, the single best law review article ever written in the subject it was written by Justice Barack, published by Harvard Law, Harvard law Review, 2004, volume 16. Harvard Law Review gave Barack 100 pages. Those of you who are in the law review business, think about that 100 pages. It's called A Judge Unjudging. The single best law review article in this business that articulates what, to your question, how do you go about creating laws? What's the role of the court? And the absolute requirement to limit the executive branch. Barack was invited, well, I can talk about this openly today. Barack was invited by Rehnquist to come meet with the American Supreme Court, which is extraordinary to have the American Supreme Court in, invite a chief justice from another court to tell him how to do this business. I mean, think about that for a second. Barack told him the following. How do I know the story? Because Barack told, tells the story. He told Rehnquist the following. I quote, he told Rehnquist, history will judge your court harshly. Now that's not an easy thing to say as an outsider to somebody, to the Chief Justice and the other Justice of the Supreme Court. It's not an easy thing to say. Rehnquist, you know, did one of these, and Barack, and Barack explained to him the following. Legislatures, you know, they decide, and the legislature that comes two years later erases it, and they do it all over again. To overturn a Supreme Court decision is all but impossible. And he tells Rehnquist, your failure to you, your failure to articulate, create laws limiting executive power in the context of national security. Well, this is my take. We'll come back and bite you in the rear end. Barack doesn't talk like, talk, doesn't talk like that. But what he told Rank was the time has come, boom, to limit executive power. Do I, people like me who believe in robust judicial review precisely because we don't have need of these <coughs> laws, you bet. And, uh, and you know, Justice Jackson, that phrase, the unfettered executive, those of you who are in law school today, I hope they're teaching this every day. It is arguably, it was in the 50s, 70 years later, 60 years later, right? The single most important phrase by an American Supreme Court. Because if you conduct counterterrorism without limits, then at the end of the day, you will never, you will never create a rights-based paradigm. You will, at the end of the day, have unlimited detention, no limits on interrogation, hold people in detention forever, and do targeted killing drone policy, where the standard is likelihood of membership. If I were to give you, hang on, if I were to give all you, your lawyers, not the law students, but the lawyers, you guys are all super smart people, all hyper successful. If I were to ask you to articulate for me a law school test that we love to give, define for me a likelihood of membership. <coughs> what the hell would you say? And then how would you implement that definition? If you could come up with some rational based answer, God bless you, sir. Uh, just one more small question, Please. Um, or kind of a half question. Half, right. so where does the half um, end? Going to the title of your talk as it was presented here, Effective Counterterrorism and the Protection of Civil Liberties. If I may respectfully say, based on your response and my further thinking about it, um, I think that the question before you, and that is more properly described in a revised title is, The Protection of Civil Liberties. Because talking about it in relation to counterterrorism is one aspect in a nation, much like Israel, and one of the few in the world, where people actually recognize that there is some kind of inherent concept, such as human rights, civil liberties, the power of government's limitation, so on and so forth, that has to do with the basic character of human existence, and that that's the highest duty of the courts as they represent the thinking of a democratic government. And that, to put it in this particular, um, is catchy. But at the same time, it's not so much the contemporane, uh, contemporaneous nature of your comment as it is the general idea that there has to be some kind of articulation in a modern context of where Absolutely. we are vis-a-vis -vis civil so, rights. I think that, hang on, because we've got to start wrapping this baby up. So, oh, <laughs> yes ma'am, law student, <laughs> students uh, above all. I have a question. Um, would you draw any kind of distinction between the rights that you would afford citizen detainees versus non-citizen detainees? And if so, where would you draw the line? Well, I think the 
somebody who's been detained in the context of counters and whatever counters, I mean, uh, the, the, the question that's been asked, I'll fine tune it for you, that's been particularly focused on is whether or not Miranda should be, to whom should Miranda be um, extended? That's been the primary question. Um, people like me argue that Miranda, clearly for anybody tried in the United States, or those who suggest that Miranda should be um, extended to individuals suspected of terrorism in the United States, I disagree with that. With respect to people who are being tried in, in, in Afghanistan, it depends again on what kind of a judicial process we set up. There's also another question, that, that the follow-up question that you need to ask. If you're going to bring people to trial in, in Bagram, Abu Ghraib, wherever, if some of the information against them is source-based rather than criminal law, how much of the information can they say, you know, they, can they see it the next party? That's, to your the question from this gentleman over here, that's a question that, when I present, when I testified this in Congress, Congress totally ducked the issue. We have not in any way resolved that. Sir? When you define what terrorism is, as you said, it's an act against innocent individuals. Correct. Is it innocent almost as, as nebulous as, as likely? No, absolutely not. An innocent individual, you are an innocent individual, a person wearing a uniform is not. So then it's non, non-military. Correct. Anyone who's non-military is innocent? Including Israeli government officials? Well, it's an interesting question about where you draw the line with government officials. The argument goes, first of all, people in uniform are not innocent. They're not civilians. So why don't you say civilians? <coughs> Maybe civilians are a better term. <coughs> Yeah, you know, there's an argument as to whether it should be innocent or civilians, and maybe maybe civilians makes it clearer. So then, then the kidnapping <coughs> of uh, Shalit is, is not an act of terrorism. Gilad Shalit is not an act of terrorism. No. I never said Gilad. Gilad, wait, hang on. I'm wait. Asking, I'm asking you your definition. No. No. Of Gilad Shalit is something. No, nobody's ever said Gilad Shalit. Gilad, Gilad Shalit is something else. I don't think it's an act of terrorism. Gilad Shalit. Those of you, everybody knows about Gilad Shalit, right? Gilad Shalit is 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 horrific, but I don't. I wouldn't define it as an act of terrorism. Okay, I just wanted. To wrap this baby up, a couple of final thoughts. One, based on the questions, obviously, this is a discussion that is ongoing. It's distressing to me that so many of these issues have yet to be resolved 10 years after 9-11. That I find distressing. And I, my instinct tells me, and I told you I've been around the block, 10 years from now, we'll still be having this discussion. That is even more distressing. But we absolutely have to begin the process of defining these basic terms, because until we do so, what we're going to do is to engage in this nebulous, standardless, nebulous counterterrorism, where anybody who's likely a member of is a legitimate target. And I suggest that is no way to conduct lawful, effective, and moral counterterrorism. On that note, thank you for your time. Oh, hang on, wait. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I have a, a question that goes back to the civil rights thing because I'm trying to put it in a context. If there's a terrorist sitting in this chair in front of me. If there's a suspected terrorist. No, 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 no. If there is a terrorist, what we're talking about in the rights is, is what are my rights as to being defined a terrorist because of my proximity or uh, other things? Is, is that the civil rights we're talking about? Is what is my right as an individual to be defined as a terrorist? Once I am defined be, by some standard, beyond the reasonable doubt, probability, Would whatever, you? there are other rights that has to do with how do you punish a terrorist. But I think, but I want to make sure that I understand that what you're talking about is what are my rights as an individual to be defined as a terrorist subject to whatever punishment right. we're talking and about after being defined. And those are two completely different things. And also, what, once we've defined you as a terrorist, what rights do we extend to you? Well, or, yes, or, or, or withhold from you. Which and also, what, what, what affirmative defenses might I have or under what circumstances Correct. have I waived those defenses, even though I might not be a terrorist, have I done something to waive my rights to, to you know, stop somebody. Right. No, and, I, and, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not getting that, that structure even from your, 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 your designations of, uh, of these different areas that have to be uh, identified. Maybe I'll have to read the papers also. So. <laughs> First of all, I will agree with you that the structure here, and because I'm old enough, I'm not going to BS you, right? Creating a structure for these four distinct paradigms is I don't, want to, I don't like the expression moving targets. We talk about target and killing and moving target doesn't work very well. It's extremely complicated. This is something else. And I agree with you that 
it doesn't really fit into a neat and, and easy box. But one of the things that for me, and I hope this came through, that's very important, is protecting the rights of multiple individuals here. One is the individual suspected of involvement in terrorism. Two is the rights of the person next to that individual, and how far do we go? And there's a whole different category of rights with the, of, of another category, and that's the people, our civilians, who need to have, be protected from these guys. How far we go to protect these guys from these guys, you know, that's a whole different discussion. But these three individuals, I won't, I won't kid you, to create a workable, articulable, easy box, it ain't gonna happen. It's not happening. For which I, I, mean, I don't apologize, but that's just the, the reality of the discussion. And it's, and it's not satisfying, and I agree with you. On that note, thank you very much.